So uh, I would like to introduce today's speaker to the Endocrine Grand Rounds, Dr. Michael Breyer, presenting his work on the application of artificial intelligence or deep learning to CKD, chronic kidney disease, mineral bone disorder. So Dr. Breyer earned his undergraduate degree and his graduate degree from Purdue. Uh, he also did a postdoc there in Indianapolis at essentially IUPUI. And his, his early work was uh, on modeling how uh, individuals handle drug dosing. So some of the early work on aminoglycoside antibiotics was done by Dr. Breyer. Uh, he has, um, he's been a, a faculty here at the University of Louisville since 1988. He rose to the level of professor, tenured professor in 2000. And since 2000, he has held a number of positions within the university at a variety of service levels. He's also been pretty much in continuous service to the Veterans Administration, and in 2019 was a, uh, established as a research health scientist at the VA. He has two patents on uh, computational methods for drug dosing. He's published over 100 uh, peer-reviewed manuscripts uh, and has had continuous funding throughout his career from either uh, industry or the NSF, or the NIH with R01 funding, or through the Veterans Administration holding many different uh, principal investigator levels on merits and R01s. So he's had an incredibly successful career and is one of the leaders or is the leader in the nation or internationally on computational methods for drug dosing. I don't mean in animals, I mean in patient populations. And his work has resulted in a couple of companies saving, I would estimate, easily into the millions of dollars of uh, efficient dosing of drugs. So those clinical practices did not lose money on inefficient dosing and the patients benefited by better outcomes. So I think this is going to be a really exciting talk today on a novel application into mineral bone disorder. All right. Thanks, Mike. So uh, as Mike said, um, I'm interested in drug dosing. I'm a pharmacokineticist, um, and so I guess I'm a mathematician in a way. Um, we've been interacting with the endocrine department uh, previously, or I have with uh, given statistic uh, talks, and this is just really an extension of the statistics. We're working with Shri uh, right now on insulin, uh, applying some of this to insulin dosing. And so uh, I think there is a number of areas where we can apply this. So um, why, why am I talking about two endocrinologists about chronic kidney disease, mineral bone disorder? Uh, well, a part of it is because that's who's funding our research at the Department of Veterans Affairs. When we submitted this grant, it went to the Indican B uh, uh, study section, and they actually loved it. So you guys are a better audience for me than the nephrologists who are all, uh, you know, got their heads up their ureters, yes. So um, let's see. Okay, no, page down. Yeah. I had it. So uh, disclosures, uh, this work is funded by the Departments of Veterans Affairs. I'm employed by the VA. Uh, and as Mike said, we have some patents on using this kind of technology, but nothing specific to this uh, endeavor. Uh, we also um, have a equity interest, or I also have equity interest in a company, Dosis, that runs this uh, program for um, anemia management. And so uh, I stole, I mean, I borrowed these slides from Dr. Eleanor Letterer, who some of you may know or some of you may not know. She was our former division chief, and she was interested in calcium and, and phosphorus uh, from bone mineral metabolism and from uh, kidney stones. And so, uh, you know, we, it, we should always, even though I'm a PhD and I work with math, I, have to, I should frame whatever I'm going to do in terms from a, a clinical perspective. And so you're presented with a patient that has ulcerations in the right foot. A, uh, a X plane film on that patient shows vascular calcification. You can see this vessel is calcified. You can see this vessel is heavily calcified. And so uh, Eleanor saw this patient and said, we're going to do some things. We're going to, we, we identified that you have critical vascular calcification. Uh, we're going to give you intensive dialysis on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to try and remove some of that calcium. We're also going to give you sodium thiosulfate at the end of dialysis to remove, remove that. And I don't know the uh, reason for this, but um, since you look like Michael Jackson, we're giving you hyperbaric therapy. 
or have you sleep in your oxygen tent? And then he showed her his hand. And uh, this is an extreme uh, calciphylaxis in, in the digits. And following uh, further involvement, the patient elected to discontinue dialysis and died within one week. So this is a, a, a huge burden on dialysis patients, calcium and phosphorus. And it leads to the primary cause of death in these patients, which is cardiovascular mortality. And so the take-home message so far is that chronic kidney disease is a systemic disorder. We saw it in their foot, we saw it in their hand, we see it in their heart. Uh, it's a major threat to patients on CKD because of the cardiovascular events that the, occur with these patients. Uh, accelerated cardiovascular mortality and morbidity are related to mineral disorder. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop ways to better treat patients uh, given this syndrome. Uh, chronic kidney disease is uh, prevalent in the United States and the world, and over 37 million people in the United States and 850 million people worldwide have chronic kidney disease. Diabetes mellitus is the most common cause of kidney failure, another endocrine disease, by the way. Uh, it's the fastest growing population is the elderly, and there are higher rates in blacks, Hispanics, Pacific Islanders, and indigenous peoples than white. And specific to the veteran population, Veterans are overrepresented in this uh, uh, in CKD as well, and so that's why this is appropriate for the Veterans Administration to study. As you can see in this slide, we see the mortality rates uh, uh, from 2005 to 2019 collected from uh, the uh, CDC, where you can see patients that are on end stage uh, have end stage renal disease and dialysis have a mortality rate that's been increasing over the year, uh, somewhat ameliorated once they hit dialysis. And you can see that uh, even though transplantation may restore what we might call normal renal function, it still doesn't return them to uh, a life expectancy as they might have had uh, previously to the development of their kidney disease. Um, the life year, year's life expectancy of patients that have uh, chronic kidney disease falls dramatically as their age increases. So I'm somewhere, I'm probably like 35. So if I were to develop CKD uh, stage three, I would expect to live 35 more years and my wife would kill me before that time came. So disproportionate cardiovascular mortality in CKD. So patients that have CKD uh, have a worse outcome than patients that have cancer. It's uh, a problem. Uh, systemic complications of CKD begins early. So if you have a patient uh, that uh, is, uh, uh, has normal renal function, is not staged, uh, what they'll develop over time is hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, volume overload, metabolic acidosis, hypocalcemia, and anemia. And what happens is you have a, an, an initial, initial injury, whatever that may be. It could be the diabetes and, and uh, uh, peripheral vascular disease associated with diabetes and you have compensatory responses. So you have uh, calcium, uh, calcium going up, phosphorus going up, you have volume overload, and all these things get progressively worse as the patient enters uh, stage five CKD. Chronic kidney disease is a systemic disorder, and all of these things that we see listed here are things that we see in chronic kidney disease patients, the ones that are shown in red, are specific to metabolic bone disease. So we can see that they have left ventricular hypertrophy, heart failure, calciphylaxis, valvular calcification, cardiac arrhythmias, and vascular calcification, as we saw in our index case that we used to, to frame the discussion today. Cardiovascular risk factors in CKD, there are the traditional ones. They have hypertension, diabetes, tobacco use, obesity, age, lipid profile, and a family history. But they also have developed anemia, acidosis, inflammation. And this is a big one for us because uh, in anemia management, the more inflamed the person is, the harder it is to get them to respond to the erythropoietin. And so we have all these things going on in these, in these patients. And you as a, a physician or a prescriber have to take all of that into account. When you see a patient, you have to ask all these questions. I saw, I don't know if anybody knows who Dr. Glaucoma is. So you guys know about Dr. Glaucoma. So I saw his TikTok uh, recently, and it was about hepatitis. And the guy goes, well, this guy, I think he has hepatitis. He goes, well, is it surface antigen? Is it core? Is it envelope? 
And he goes, uh, I don't know, maybe it's this one. And then he goes, well, what is it? Do you have antibodies to this? And there were like 15 things that you had to take into account in order to diagnose hepatitis B. Well, there are probably more than that for this. So uh, I, I just found that an interesting uh, a, a, a approach uh, or a, an interesting example, because that's what we're going to use artificial intelligence to help us figure out. So CKD MBD is a systemic disorder. It uh, has abnormalities in calcium, phosphorus, PTH, and vitamin D metabolism. There's an abnormality in bone turnover, mineralization, volume, and linear growth or strength of the bone. There is calcification of soft tissue. And what we have going on is that we have an excretory failure in phosphorus. So the first thing that happens is the kidney is the only way to get rid of phosphorus, essentially. And when you don't get rid of it, the kidney has to respond to that. And so what it does is it starts changing some of these uh, metabolic uh, pathways that regulate phosphate metabolism in the body, and they start changing. And uh, FGF23 is the primary phosphaturic hormone in the body, and so you have increase in FGF23. And there are some childhood abnormalities where there's an antibody that uh, you give to FGF23, and it cures them of their disorder. And so uh, FGF23 is, a, is a, a primary moderator of that. But what you also have is you have a PTH increasing. And then when you, do, when you have PTH increase, you have decrease in uh, calcitriol, or your calcitriol causes more change in PTH, and then you have changes in calcium. And then when that, with the change in calcium, the calcium moves from the bone, and the bones become brittle, and they break. Where does it go? It goes into soft tissue, and it calcifies those soft tissues. This is all Eleanor stuff that I'm just going to blitz on through because I don't care. I don't understand it. So ultimately what we see is, once again, we have uh, something that happens to a patient, and they start losing renal function. And they have these compensatory responses that lead to hyperphosphatemia, hypocalcemia, hyperparathyroidism, calcitriol deficiency, and, FS, and FGF23 excess. Uh, you have uh, a homeostatic collapse of the system. And uh, you end up with, if untreated, you'll end up with that patient that we saw in, 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 as our in, in incident patient. What this does is kidney injury leads to all these changes in, that we can measure either routinely uh, on monthly labs that we get on patients or in the laboratory. We can go in and I can ask Mike Merchant to develop an assay for some of these things or I can ask him to develop, uh, to look at this data and say, what new uh, markers of metabolic bone disease can we see? And hopefully 20 years from now, we'll be able to develop drugs that will treat each one of those. But right now, we don't have that. What we have is calcium, phosphorus, and PTH. Uh, those problems, those changes lead to fractures and cardiovascular events. So those are the things that we want to try and stop patients from having. Uh, phosphate retention uh, leads to increased PTH, increase in FGF23, decrease in vitamin D, and decrease in clotho. Clotho is a, a peptide, or I guess a peptide, that binds with FGF23 that allows that receptor complex to work and, and process the signal. These are enemies of the state, and these are our CV friends. So we want these to go up, and we want this to go up, and how do we do that? Well, right now, we give calcitriol to our patients. So we try to artificially increase vitamin D. We don't have a mechanism to artificially increase clotho. So what we have to do there is we have to change phosphate. Uh, ultimately, what that leads to is uh, these calcium plaques that we can see in the, the arteries of our patients. And as uh, Rosemary Youssef uh, said to me, if you have somebody that has bad vessels, you want them to go to Florida to have their bypass surgeries because the physicians down there have seen these vessels all their life. And I guess it's hard to suture into a, pay, uh, a vessel that has all this calcium. So maybe not so much in Louisville, but in Florida they have an, an overabundance of people with this kind. Of um, so these things are all interconnected too. So if I change PTH, not only am I going to change, uh, uh, not, am I, not only am I going to have that uh, clinic, reach the clinical outcome of decreasing PTH within the range, but I'm also going to have a, an effect on vitamin D. I'm going to have an effect on FGF23. I'm going to have an effect on uh, serum phosphorus, which then also has an effect on clotho and, and everything else. So this is all interconnected, and how to figure out how to do that uh, is where it becomes difficult to, to manage. So 
This leads up to the rationale for a systems approach to CKD-MBD. The, complex, the complexity of the CKD-MBD uh, milieu uh, precludes the ability to easily construct, construct a clinical trial, because if I go in and I say, I'm going to test an FGF23 drug, how do I hold all those other things uh, I I stable, right? So whenever you do a randomized cl con controlled clinical trial, you only want to manipulate one thing and hold everything else constant because you're, you want to look at that. But with this uh, syndrome or this disease, just by mon uh, changing one, you change all these other factors downstream. And so it becomes difficult. And so what we want to do is we want to approach this in silico by developing a mathematical model that explains how all these systems work so that we can easily manipulate each component and, and uh, address that. Uh, we can predict numerous unmeasured and unmeasurable parameters. So right now, uh, every month our dialysis unit measures calcium, phosphorus, and PTH, and they treat, they change the dose of phosphate binder, uh, calcitriol, and a calcium emetic based on those measures. But that's not what we're really interested in. We're interested in calcium moving from the bone to decrease fracture rate. And we're interested in calcium moving into the tissue to decrease cardiovascular events. So we can develop a model that looks at those movements. And maybe we can come up with a better way to treat this disease by looking at those using a, a model. And this goes back 30 years ago. Why do you have to use rats in research? Can't you just come up with a computer model to do this? Well, that's what we're doing. We're coming up with a computer model that we can use in lieu of rats. And we populate that computer model with human data and not rat data, because rats in mice are notoriously not human. So if you do study in a mouse and you show a result, they, that pathway may not even exist in humans. And you've shown something that we don't know what the effect of it is. So, uh, and we can do lots of other things with it. So what is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is a set of combinational tools derived from empiric data that facilitate problem solving that is com commonly done by humans. So uh, you see a patient, and they come in, and they have this metabolic profile, and your mind stores that away. And they, you go on, you see the next patient, and something else comes up. And then you see another patient that looks like that first patient. And then you store it in your mind. You say, well, that first time I saw that, this patient had this diagnosis. So that, that, pa that diagnosis is going to move up higher on your, on your list of problems with that patient, because you've seen them before. And if you've been around a long time, you've seen hundreds of those patients. And so you're developing your own neural network, obviously, that looks at patterns uh, that are presented to you and come up with a diagnosis. We can do that with a computer, and computers don't have strokes. They, 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 don't, uh, uh, they don't get tired. Uh, if they're on call for 24 hours and they're in the middle of the night and they get called with something, they, they, they're not falling asleep. So computers can do some of this that humans are doing, but they can do it uh, in, a, in a different way. So it allows us to do rapid analysis of large complex data sets. So now with the advent of these wonderful tools that you have available to you, like Cerner and uh, Epic, which you all love, I'm sure, um, we have in this Louisville area, we have all this data that we can then use to, to uh, look at patients. And so how do we get through all of that data? Uh, and we can do that with computers. It can use it to develop a diagnostic and therapeutic algorithms, which we're going to talk about today. Uh, identification of previous overlooked patterns, which is uh, not what we're doing today, but uh, has some applications. And you can use it to generate a hypothesis and then test the hypothesis in silico, design a human study based on those results, and then carry out that study without uh, wasting human effort in experiments that don't go anywhere. What can artificial intelligence not do? You can't just hand me data and say, Mike, do this. Is it going to give me an answer? Because it can't give you an answer. Uh, it, can, it, it can contribute to the development of a testable hypothesis, but it cannot develop new diagnoses or ideas. That's, a, that's, a, that's Eleanor's understanding of what it can do. But in, in a way, it, it can develop. It can say, I have a kidney biopsy. And in the kidney biopsy, you can look at uh, membranous inclusions, right? So you can look at inclusion bodies in that, and that leads you down to the pathway that there is some immuno, immune complex that's depositing in there, and the pathologist will pull that all out. 
And you can, you can identify all those patterns because the pathologists have already identified it. Uh, if I took all those biopsy slides and I do something that's called self-sorting or fuzzy clustering, it can take all these patterns and lump them into, into individual groups. And then you say, you might see that, oh, this group is a group of glomerulonephritis, and this is a group of uh, membranous uh, proliferation, and this is, and now I have a group that isn't identified in any of those. So it may be able to give you a group of people that we don't know what's going on that we can further look at, then I can hand the data over to, we can take the data and merchant can do uh, uh, micro dissection on the glomeruli and he can look at the glomeruli proteins and he can identify something else that's going on. So it can do that, but it, it, for the most part it's not. But it's not, it's not an end all be all. It's only as good as the data that we have available. Current examples of artificial uh, intelligence and nephrology uh, are um, kidney biopsy analysis. So there are some programs that will look at kidney biops biopsies. Uh, they increase efficiency and a lot faster than humans. But they get, there are no better than the pathologist that identified the samples in the first place. Because it looks at, uh, a pathologist comes in, says this biopsy is case, this is a, a diagnosis A, B, C, and D. That's all it can do. It can never do better than that. It can't get better than, the, than, typically they don't get better. And in fact, they're a little bit worse. The other one is anemia management, which I talked about at the beginning. And right now we're managing <coughs> Calvin. It's okay, buddy. Um, right now we're managing uh, in excess of 160,000 dialysis patients every month. Uh, and um, that's why we're, we're doing what we're doing. Uh, we can do some proposed um, uh, study applications like prediction of GFR decline in uh, 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 polycystic kidney disease or AGA, IGA nephropathy. We can look at tacrolimus bioavailability, which is a similar uh, uh, pharmacokinetic approach, dialysis adequacy, risk of acute kidney injury in hospitalized patients, and a project that we're working on with J. L. Soskis is uh, when we do dialysis, we collect all the information that occurs during a dialysis session, and we think that we can look at the patterns in the uh, perfusion, pump perfusion pump pressures, say that three times real fast, to identify that the patient has a uh, stenosis. So we're doing that now. So those are some of the applications that we can do. This is the, uh, as they say in uh, Casablanca, round up the usual list of suspects. So these are the usual list of suspects. And without Adam Govenda, who is here in the middle, none of this would be possible because he's the engineer that is the expert in, in uh, control and uh, analysis. Um, we also wouldn't be doing this because, uh, without an Eleanor's involvement because she's the crazy person that's interested in bone. So, and this is done at the Louisville VA, which some of you here will notice, but this is the, uh, the uh, Dallas VA, uh, which looks nicer than our VA. So, I don't know. Maybe we'll get, when we get our new VA, it'll look nice too. So, the goal here is to develop and validate a model for CKD MBD, uh, achieve, accessibility to achieve therapeutic goals, and the accessibility to predict bone and cardiovascular effects of therapy. So, we have a model. And we uh, started with a model that was published in 2010 by Peterson and Riggs, which they used uh, to um, get FDA approval of a new, like, bisphosphonate. Actually, this was a, a PTH uh, monoclonal antibody, I, I guess. And so they developed this model for a pharmaceutical company and they shared that information with us. We then modified that model to meet the goals. But basically, we have to build a model of the gut, of the kidney, of the uh, parathyroid gland, and the bone. So we model each one of these individual uh, compartments of what's going on in the middle, in them, and use that to develop our, uh, in, our in silico human. Um, I'm just going to skip through some of this because I'm not really interested as much in giving you that information. But uh, in the end, there's 100 parameters that we have to estimate. So some of those parameters we fix on based on literature values. Okay, so uh, like calcium absorption in the gut. How much calcium can be absorbed in the gut? We just use literature values on that. 
uh, literature values on when we, when we use dialysis, we know that uh, the dialysis membrane, calcium and phosphorus will pass that membrane, and so those things are fixed. We don't have to reestimate those. But what's going on with calcium in the bone? We have to go in and estimate that because we, we have to guess because we're not doing bone, marrow, we're not doing bone biopsies on these patients. Uh, I guess you could go in and label the bone with um, tetracycline, and you could look at bone turnover. Uh, that's a little invasive. So we, we don't do that. So we, there are some things that we're, you can call it guessing, but we're calling it estimating. Estimating sounds better than guessing. So uh, there was a very large study that was done called the CRIC study, which is the chronic renal insufficiency cohort, where they followed uh, thousands of patients, and they measured uh, their GFR over time, and they have phosphorus on them, and they have PTH, and this is, the res this is what our model says happens during uh, the fall in GFR for phosphorus. This is what the model says happens to PTH, and uh, we've published this in 2021 in the American Journal of Renal Physiology. This is what the model says happens to calcitriol. And this is what it says happens to FGF23, which is not measured routinely, but we have it in this study. And so uh, this is the first indication that our model is actually something that we can use to look at unmeasured parameters, right? So FGF23 was measured in the study, but clinically not measured. And so if you want to know what's going on in clinically not measured things, we can use this model to, to, to do that. You'll see that there's a lot of, there is variability, right? And we control, we end up do, using another procedure to control for variability in the end. We could go in and estimate for each individual patient in this cohort uh, their parameters, and we will do that. But at, right at this point, we don't need to do that in order to come up with a dosing tool. So, but we will, we're, we're planning to do that in the future. So, what happens to a patient that has CKD and uh, enters dialysis? So, a patient that's uh, coming into, into CKD will have a very low calcium. And so, we'll start dialysis, and dialysis will actually correct that calcium to a certain extent. And so the next thing that we'll do is we'll, we could run them on that. Uh, the next thing that a physician, a nephrologist will do, will add phosphate binders. How compliant do you think patients are with phosphate binders? It's a big old horse pill that they take with every meal. Not very compliant, right? So when we look at this data, we'll show you that we, we took in the, into consideration the fact that patients may have different compliance with this, with this uh, drug or this uh, binder. But it's the best thing that we can do to remove phosphorus from these patients and, and stop it from being absorbed in the first place. So this is the border wall between uh, Texas and Mexico. As you can see, it's permeable. It may not hold everybody out, but it does, it does more than what we were doing before. The first thing is, I don't, uh, anybody do market day in the room? Know, know what market day is? Well, Market Day was this great chicken that my daughter would, they would sell in her grade school. And why does it taste so good? Phosphorus. It has, it's coated in phosphorus. So every processed food that we have has so much phosphorus in it, it's killing our patients. But Chick-fil-A tastes good. I'm going to eat Chick-fil-A. So the next thing that we do, uh, and, and typically, this is a step therapy, just like in, in hypertension, you would start maybe with a diuretic and not go straight to something heavy. You're going you're to start with phosphate binders, then you're going to add uh, vitamin D, calcitriol. And you can see calcitriol helps correct the calcium pretty good. And in this case, it's supposed to be to near 8.9 8 uh, is what we're looking for. But uh, you may add a calcium emetic. So calcium emetic binds to the calcium sensing receptor and, ch and decreases the uh, uh, excretion, secretion of, of PTH in the parathyroid gland. So in this, case, in this specific example, we wouldn't use a calcium emetic to, to change this calcium, but that's the third thing that we would do. Now let's look and see what happens with phosphorus. So in phosphorus, phosphorus is high. We add the binder, it goes down. We add calcitriol, it, go, uh, it, it goes down a little bit more. But you see this little bump here? This is problematic for nephrologists, and they're going to go crazy when they 
So what they won't let us do, and they probably should, is they won't, there will be resistance to giving somebody a calcitriol when they have a high phosphorus because they think that the phosphorus is going to go higher, and we'll explain that later. In this case, calcium mimetics don't really change phosphorus very much, so we're not going to use that to treat phosphorus, but we are worried about this little bump. Um, what happens to PTH? Well, the calcium mimetic, as we said, really helps with the PTH at the end, right? So this is fine-tuning. This is like, uh, this is like the, the uh, glomerulus. This is the sodium concentration in the, in the urine as it goes through the glomerulus and then goes through the, air, uh, through the descending uh, tubules into the loop of Henle. This is where we're doing fine-tuning down here with calcium mimetic, so that's why we use it last. And then FGF23. So the reason we're interested in FGF23 is because it's the up-and-coming uh, peptide that will probably be added in the near future to any panel that we're going to evaluate patient, patients on. So uh, it's the future. And we're still interested in this little peak. Um, so what do we think is going on? Well, we had measurable, right? We had calcium, phosphorus, PTH. We have uh, unmeasured FGF23. And now we're going to talk about the unmeasurable, right? So we're, what we're really interested in is addressing the unmeasurable things that are occurring in the body. And that's the movement of calcium. And calcium and phosphorus always move together. So when you have calcium move into the bone, phosphorus goes with it. When you have calcium move out of the bone, phosphorus goes with it. And so what happens to these, these fluxes uh, from the bone in blue and into the vasculature in red? So you start dialysis, they go down, which is what we want them to do. I don't have the normal ranges here because it's kind of imaginary, but we want it to go down. Uh, phosphate binders, they both go down. Calcitriol, they both go down. When you add the calcium mimetic in here, or when you add the, the calcitriol here, here's that bump that we see in vascular calcium flux. So the vascular calcium flux goes up a little bit, but then it comes down because we have a change in flux from the bone. And so Hartman Maluka, who is the chief of nephrology at that other Kentucky university that sometimes people get confused, like our, our acting presidents, for instance, at the graduation talk where she called us the University of Kentucky. People get confused all the time. Hartman is the, uh, is the uh, and he's a big bone guy. He has biopsy data. And he thinks that the phosphorus that we're seeing in the blood, a lot of it's coming from the bone. And so when we go back to when we go back to the nephrologists and talk to them, well, if we give calcitriol, what we're, we're going to see an immediate uh, absor increased absorption of calcium and phosphorus from the gut. But by decreasing calcium phosphorus coming out of the bone, we'll counteract that. And the data that's what our data is showing us. So uh, that's one of the things that we might learn from this. So we have a working model now. What? How do we create a process that will deliver personalized and individualized patient to the therapy to the patient? So we have two targets, right? We have our clinical uh, practice guidelines, which are calcium, phosphorus, and PTH. And then we have bone fluxes. So the first thing that we addressed, and I don't think I talk about it in here, is just meeting the KDGO guidelines. So KDGO, K, uh, kidney disease, outcomes, improvement, something or other. So we introduced this concept of machine learning. Okay, so I talked about all the variability that we saw before. So the way to get rid of variability is you add control on top of that. And the control on top of that, when, you, when the uh, system makes a prediction of where they're going to be, and that prediction is different than uh, truth when you measure something, the difference is error, right? The control architecture then incorporates that error back into the prediction and says, uh, my, model, my model is wrong by 10%. Let's make an adjustment for that in the control structure and not, we don't have to change the model, we can make adjustment for that error in the control structure. So that's what we're doing. It provides with parameters of interest. It can be trained through thousands of simulations, millions of pieces of data. It learns how each individual responds to therapy, and it makes therapeutic recommendations based on parameter guidelines and individual subject response. So what we do is we take 80 simulated patients, and we say, I'm going to draw in these 80 patients uh, a phosphorus anywhere from 3 to 10. So they can uniformly have any of those values, and you do that for calcium, phosphorus, and PTH. So you have 
a, 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 a constellation of uh, starting values. And then you let the program run. And you say, make it do better. And so that's how it learns. It looks at that data. And there will be, there'll be instances in there that you would might not ever see physiologically, but it'll still use that information to learn. And what it, what, so what we do is we compare that to what we do now. So for instance, uh, our CKD protocol in the dialysis unit might say if phosphorus is high, and greater than this high value. So I say if phosphorus is higher than five, then increase phosphate binder. If it's less, decrease phosphate binder. It's something you've seen all the time, right? This is typical uh, uh, medicine. And then you can do the same thing for calcitriol and calcinomatic. You can have an algorithm that goes through and says, I've made it your PTH, it's higher than I want it to be, and calcium is lower than, than I want it to be, so you'll increase calcitriol. And you go through the, this algorithm. So you, we can make a comparison to what makes sense uh, uh, clinically now. And, uh, but then we can do this training that I talked about where you have uh, 80 patients. We, tr we go through uh, years of, what we do is we step the patients through ESRD. And so we start them out at a glomerular filtration of 100. We start decreasing their GFR. We get their calcium, phosphorus, and PTHs to move out of range. And then we start them on dialysis, because all we're talking about at this point is dialysis patients. And uh, we can train an agent, and one of the nice things about the, what, the tool that we're using, it can develop, the, it can come up with these trees, a decision tree. So if the calcium is before, above or below 8.25, you go this way. And then it says, what, well, what's the PTH? And if you can look in this one, what's the PTH here? And you can just follow it down here. And, um, in this case, if you came down this pathway, it would say increase by two units the calcitriol dose. So calcitriol is given in 30, 60, 80, 90, I think. So it would tell you, let's say you're on 30, it would tell you to go to 90. It's depending on what they're on. Uh, and so we can do that. So ultimately, we can take all the math out of this and we can come up with these decision trees and make it very easy for people to implement. But there's minutia within this that's going to result in that variability that we saw in the, in the, in the very beginning. So uh, even though we can distill this down to something that's very usable, we, we think the best way to do this is to implement this as a computer program tied to an EMR. So our computers can learn in two different ways. One is supervised and one is, rein is reinforcement learning. In supervised, this is what they use for the, the looking at the biopsy data, right? So they have all this data. They have an expert come in and say, this is, this is A, this is B, this is A, this is B, this is C, this is C, this is C. And you have uh, 10,000 biopsies that you went through. It learns what that is. And you can use what's called an artificial neural network. You can do linear regression. You can do a factor analysis, a statistical technique. And that's supervised because I have observations and I have the answer. And that, when you do that, you can reproduce what a human does. And so in 1950, uh, Turing uh, came up with this hypothesis, right? Can, it, it, in order to uh, see if computers can think like humans, you have to develop a program that an, it, when somebody looks at it, they can't determine whether it's a computer or a human doing the work. Well, you, what you result in here is that decision. I can't determine if it's a computer or a human, but it's not going to do any better than the human. What we want to do is we want to improve on uh, human learning, and we do that uh, using reinforcement learning. And in reinforcement learning, uh, each cycle that it goes through, uh, it will say, did I meet my target? Did I, did I predict properly what the calcium, phosphorus, and PTH is going to be? And if I don't, uh, then it, it, it reinforces positive, right? So when you're, for those who can't see me, my dog is here with me. And uh, when I was training him on how to sit, uh, I would reinforce that, right? I'd say, Calvin, sit. Good boy. So I reinforce him with a, a, a positive command, 
and I would give him a treat. And then I'd say, Pa. Oh, come on, Pa. There's a good boy. So reinforcement learning. You don't beat the dog. Calvin, have you ever been beaten? He says no. <laughs> so you do the same thing with computers. You do the same thing with your children. You do the same thing with your interns, residents, and fellows, because we're not allowed to be mean to them anymore. Right? can't be mean to an intern resident. You can't say they did something wrong. You say, well, that's a good teachable moment, right? So you go into what you've done, you do the same thing with computers. And uh, so basically you reward them zero to one. You give them a zero uh, if they, you know, there's no participation pro trophies in, in AI. You get a zero to one, okay? So if they get a one, they know they're doing the right thing and they're gonna keep moving in that direction. So that's reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is called natural learning because that's how we all learn. Or most of us, I didn't learn that way. My mom beat me. I, I went to Catholic school and the nuns beat us to death. They probably don't do that anymore. Maybe I deserved it. So machine learning and medicine, reinforcement learning. We have two things that they like that they, that, so just like every, uh, 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 discipline. Everybody likes to reinvent names for everything to make themselves sound cool. So in order for me to sound cool, I'm going to use these terms environment, agent, reward, state, and action. Okay, now I sound cool because you're like, I don't know what he's talking about. Well, the environment, what's the environment? Anybody want to, what's the environment? Uh, in terms of what we've already talked about, what's, what's my, what have I already introduced as the environment? Okay, so my environment would, could be uh, chronic kidney disease, right? And we have a model of chronic kidney disease. So that model that I showed er earlier is the environment. What's the agent? What's the agent that acts on the environment? Could be the physician. Could be the, it could be the computer. So the agent can be a physician. We can use the physician as an agent, or we can use the computer. So those, so environment is just a mathematical model. Actually, all of this is math, but the environment is a mathematical model, and the agent is the person that's acting on that model. And it could be that it's going to do, it's going to do actions, as I show here. And then um, uh, Dr. Moshe Gundam, when he's rounding with you, and you know you're, you come in at 6 a.m. to see your patients, and he walks in and he says, "Well, tell me about this patient's. Uh, you know, you gave them insulin yesterday, and and uh, uh, how are they doing? And uh, you you you've done the right thing." He's going to say, "Good job. That's exactly what you needed to do. If you did the, if you did the wrong thing, he's going to use that to teach you." Right? He's going to use you. He's going to say, "Well, maybe we should have. Maybe we could do this. What lab do you think you could order right now to do a little better job?" And so he's going to he's going to reinforce what you've already done, and but he's going to try to move you in the right direction. So that's what the computer's doing. Uh, the state or state of or observations is what is it, what is the outcome that we're trying to mon monitor? Right. So uh, in this case, we can have these different things. Okay. So we have the model. We have the physician. CKD MBD goals. That's what's driving everything that we want to do. We want to achieve those goals, and we have the clinical parameters. We have calcium, phosphorus, and PTH, and the action is calcium, emetic, vitamin D, and phosphate binder. So this is this is how we set up machine learning for this this example. Um, advantages of reinforcement and supervised learning over supervised learning is it goes beyond replicating existing medical experience, right? So um, um, if you have a patient. And somebody comes in, and you, you always treated these patients in a certain way. And uh, so I was watching MASH over the weekend. So those of you that are older will understand it. So MASH was a medical show that took place in Korea, and it was about a bunch of surgeons. And there was a, there was a surgeon that was trained in Boston, so he was obviously better than everybody else, or he thought he was. And uh, Colonel Morgan was the, the, the leader of the group. And he went in and he did some kind of fancy suturing, and he learned it from reading an article. You know, he didn't go anywhere to learn how to do it because he couldn't when you're in a war zone. So he learned how to do that by reading an article. So he he used a learning technique, and uh, Major Winchester was flabbergasted because he's the best surgeon there is, and he didn't know how to do this procedure because it wasn't in his experience. 
So uh, uh, Harry Morgan, who was the the uh, the colonel, he he expanded his his uh, view of things by by reading the literature. Okay, so that's how we learn, right? We go out and we expand our view. So if I have data of everything that we've done in the past, but everything we did, let's say everything we did in the past only kept me within, you know, uh, if I'm shooting free throws, and everything I've done in the past, my free throw rate is 60%, and then somebody shows me a new way to do something and it goes up to 80%, well, I couldn't learn that from what I did before. I had to learn something new. And so that's what the computer's doing. It's looking outside of what you normally are doing to look at new combinations. Now, some of these combinations might be deadly, but it learns that I shouldn't do that. So we know that a calcium below six is pretty bad. So we, we really heavily penalize results of calcium less than six and less than seven. So we can shape, shape the uh, function. And so we, we, we don't want to just replicate what everything that's done been done before because there's no, no movement forward in that. Coupled with reward, it rapidly achieves goals through potentially novel pathways. You may learn something new. So there's a, the, the best example of this, and I don't play Go, there's a game called Go, kind of like checkers or something. And the, uh, they used reinforcement learning. They te taught a computer how to play Go, and then they played the world's experts, kind of like the chess one. And the computer learned to do a move that nobody had ever seen before. And they're all like, my gosh, I never thought to do that. But it worked. So hopefully what we're going to discover in the future is, wow, I never thought to do it that way. Um, and the patient lives. That's the important thing. Uh, but uh, so we can test different hypotheses with that uh, of how we're going to do something, and then it's in, uh, we can do in sickle trials. So ultimately, what have we been able to do? So we have uh, phosphorus concentrations uh, that in these patients that I, these 80 patients that I ran through, and just using supervised learning, which is the uh, physician-based learning, we can decrease phosphorus. We can do a pretty good job, but we can do a better job using reinforcement learning. Uh, for calcium, same thing. We, we can raise calcium uh, using uh, physician, because we, these things work, otherwise we wouldn't do them, I think. But reinforcement learning can lead to a little bit more improvement. Uh, we can decrease uh, PTH. Um, but we can also look at what the effect is on calcitriol. So if we want calcitriol to go up higher or lower, we can actually uh, have the computer um, target calcitriol rather than calcium, phosphorus, and PTH, because calcitriol is what we're interested in. Or if we're interested in FGF levels, we can actually decrease those better. We can, we can reimagine the question, and rather than our clinical outcomes being calcium, phosphorus, and PTH, they could be FGF23, calcitriol, and calcium flux. And uh, so just to show you, we know that patients aren't adherent. Uh, what do you do when a patient's not adherent? Uh, do you give them more vitamin D, or do you give them more sinicalcid? And so what happens is what this shows is uh, the impact on bone flux as you lose, uh, as you get the patient that's uh, uh, less adherent to phosphate binders. You can see that these numbers are all going down. And uh, you can compensate for that by increasing the calcitriol dose. But not necessarily all of the calcium emetic. So the, the goal here would be to increase calcitriol. So what we learned from this is in, in not inherent patients, the best way to treat them would be with vitamin D. Um, here's the result of 100 simulations. Uh, this is the PTH looking at the different adherence levels. Uh, decreased adherence did not negatively affect PTH achieved, but did result in an increased dose of vitamin D and calcium emetic. So uh, PTH, we can still get it to go down, but we have to substitute other drugs to get that effect. Here's uh, calcium flux into the, the vasculature. Uh, if, you, if they're not adherent to uh, their phosphate binders, we really can't impact their vascular calcification, which is an important quite thing as well. Uh, we can uh, see different effects on, on bone. So we have a bigger effect on bone than we can vasculature. But we're not targeting vasculature at this point. We're targeting serum, calcium, phosphorus, and PTH. 
And so uh, what we want to do is we want to reimagine. And so we're working on an abstract for the ASN, our national meeting, which is in two weeks, uh, to get that done. Now, we can also ask a question of the model. What's the most important information that we're giving you to make your decisions? And this is uh, phosphorus from uh, current phosphorus, last month's phosphorus, and two months ago. This is current calcium, calcium one month ago, two months ago. PTH, one month ago, two months ago. So the level of information that you're providing has value. And the most valuable information that we have right now is, is their current calcium and PTH. So that's what's driving this. And so it allows you to reimagine what you need to, to, to follow. Um, we're getting really close to the end. Um, so the model affirms the primacy of phosphate control and the treatment of CKD MBD. Are our phosphate guidances, guidelines appropriate? Do they need to be individualized? And we would say yes. The model demonstrated superiority of higher vitamin D analog use, primarily in preventing bone loss. It, our fear is that raising phos, uh, phosphorus with vitamin D analogs hindering therapy. So a uh, physician won't give more, uh, our nephrologist won't give more. You guys know Dr. Nyack? She's crazy, right? Well, I rounded with her. And I tried to get her to do it, and she wouldn't. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe. I don't know. So do we need to modify the model for refractory hyper? Uh, phosphatemia. And the model suggests that soft tissue calcification at this point is poorly amenable by therapy and the, you know, we, obviously we're starting too late. Once the patient hits stage 5 CKD, it's too late to get rid of the bad things that have already happened. Uh, but studies have shown that starting sooner don't really help that much either. And so maybe they're targeting the wrong thing. Uh, we know that we're initiating too late because our model says this is what's happening to uh, the bone to blood flux of calcium goes down. G, this is a GF, or th I'm sorry, this is at GFR 40, we see these things are changing uh, dramatically. Uh, gut absorption doesn't really change that much. Kidney excretion obviously falls off quite a bit at, at, the, at the end. But these things, bone demineralization and tissue mineralization have started at 40. Uh, lessons learned, extraordinary diversity in CKD MBD biomarker in uh, clinical manifestation. Transfer of calcium phosphorus from the bone to vascular smooth muscle begins very rarely in CKD, and we lack easily measured tan targetable clinical relevant therapeutic goals in early CKD. And uh, I'm going to just end there with, uh, with that because I think we're at time. Yep. So uh, I'm looking at the uh, chart. Oh, let me, in case you need it. Yeah, these are just the drugs coming down the pike. These are interesting to Eleanor. And here, this is the code for today. So you get CME credit. And so uh, I'm, I've got the chat box open if anybody has any questions there. Uh, I'd like to open it then to the 50,000 people that are in the room. Yeah, if you just walk to the microphone and not push over each other, appreciate it. But thanks. Mike? I do have a question. Sure. Your last model that you were building from 80 patients, mm -hmm. is that in silico patients? Or that those are in silico patients. Historical data? Uh, those are the patients that we we said we took and randomly pulled calcium phosphorus and, and PTH values and started them into the in, into the progressing through ESRD. So, so when you were manipulating, when you were going through your modeling process, mm -hmm. I think you had three factors that you followed and three that you manipulated. Yes. Um, were you manipulating those one at a time? Oh, no, all together, simultaneously. All together. So, yeah, that's that's a good point because uh, the physicians, as I found with rounding with them, is that they won't change the vitamin D and the sinicalcid at the same time. They'll only change one, and then they'll change another one. There's uh, the the... Can we shorten that? And we would think that, yes, we can shorten that. But that's a good point because uh, what we're trying to do is get people to rethink how they may do some things. And uh, so that's a barrier. And that's one of the things when we implemented uh, the anemia management protocol uh, with DaVita. DaVita has like 9,000 nephrologists in their network. So you have 9,000 different opinions. and. You know, one guy's going to complain about one thing, and another guy's going to complain about the exact opposite. So you can't please them, 
And so there's a lot of, uh, so we have a, we have a, uh, um, we have a, a process going in, it's called physician in the loop. So we're gonna start evaluating that through physician in the loop. There's a question here. What are the potential problems of excess vitamin D? Um, I don't really know uh, uh, on, we don't really see that in dialysis patients that they have excess uh, vitamin D, they're always low. So I don't know, uh, maybe Sheree can tell me what the problem would be. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so the, the the answer would be that we we have pro problems with calcium homeostasis, which could lead to uh, uh, kidney stones and more uh, vascular calcification. The next question is: Can bone density measurements in, measurements indicate CKD? Um, Bone density uh, uniformly decreases in CKD po uh, population, but if you draw a Venn diagram of everybody that had decreased mineral bone density, you're probably going to see more people in the not CKD group than you are in the CKD group. Um, certainly, one of the big, the big, can, okay, so Eleanor in her slide said that diabetes is the biggest contributor to CKD. I think it's age. If you if you look at any EGFR formula, whether it's race corrected or not, there's always age. So age is the biggest contributor to CKD uh, changes, and you'll see that for osteoporosis too. Primarily, I guess more for women than for men. Uh, yeah, Mike. Okay. So. Uh, oh, you guys got to see him up there. Drug company that patent. that formulary and add in another drug and have a new patent, yep. and that then becomes the latest, greatest uh, intervention. Right. Does your method allow you to develop a combination therapy for bone mineral disease that would be a better intervention? Um, certainly, uh, so the question is, uh, how do you take into account the fact that uh, either you have multiple drugs to treat the same indication, or a company may reformulate their medication and add some increased patent life to it? Uh, these techniques are agnostic. They don't care. Uh, they, uh, uh, so uh, there are five different phosphate binders that are used. There are several different forms of vitamin D that are used. There's only two uh, forms of uh, calcium emetic that are used. And the way that we have that entered into the model is that, let's say the phosphate binder, we know that uh, per gram, how much phosphorus each one of those phosphate binders can, can absorb, and so it's in the model. Uh, we know that uh, the calcium sensing receptor, we know that we have in, embedded into the model the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of parsevib and sinicalcid, which are the two calcium emetics. And so we, we have that embedded into the model. So we, ha we have the receptor concentration because most drugs act through receptors. And so using that model, we, we have that built into the, so it's complicated, but it, it's agnostic. And, and the best example of that are our tool for anemia management. There are three uh, drugs, uh, Epigen, which is the shortest acting first on the market, Aranest, which is a little bit longer acting, uh, second on the market, and then Mercera, because I can't think of what its real name is. I, I'll use the trade name, which is very long acting. And actually, we've been looking through this, and we always thought Mercera was bad, that it wasn't a really good, very good drug for anemia management. But we've, we looked recently through thousands of patients that have been used using our tool, and actually, it does really well. And more importantly, our tool is able to decrease the Mercera dose by 50% and maintain hemoglobin. So that's what happens when you, you know, if you have a preconceived notion, be, be prepared for it to be wrong. Um, so what's the thing yeah. that the goal is, I mean, the calcium and the phosphate and the are kind of surrogates. Mm -hmm. So the eventual thing is either the bone or more important with the vascular one. Right, right, right. So how does this sort of so, um, modeling, do you look at the eventual outcome? Well, so over, uh, uh, in our next VA project, we've, we've 
we've so we've asked to do more intensive sampling of individual patients to get at those bone health parameters and so we're going to get get measurements of mineral bone density we're going to get some there's a calcium index that you can get from x-rays I don't know how good it is I they shot down my idea I thought aortic arch it's huge you could probably biopsy that right they didn't want to do that so that's why I'm not in charge of anything so obviously what would be a really cool way to do this transplant when a patient goes in for transplant and they take a kidney they take a piece of tissue we could get we could get calcium information from that so that's what we really want to know we want to know what those things are right now we the 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 guidelines it's just like um, um, measuring serum glucose and your other measure for how well they're controlled yeah hemoglobin a1c below a certain target same thing it's not really the exact thing that you're looking at but it's the best we have right now so the best we have right now is calcium phosphorus and PTH and we have studies where we have manipulated patients to achieve different values and then you have so you have uh, when you have a uh, clinical practice guideline, you'll have two level, you'll have several levels of excellence, right? Evidence. One is from randomized cl cl clinical controlled trials. One is from non-randomized control or non-randomized trials. One's from case reports, and one's opinion. A lot of this in this area is opinion. This is their opinion of what you should do. So what we're hoping is that we'll be able to use this to dry to remove some of the opinion based protocols so it can be used to treat people but also to answer these questions so in, in all these curves have white right so in this model what happens that white base right something that's There, there, there's a potential that somebody could be an outlier that just doesn't that it get lost in, but we haven't observed, we haven't seen that, but that's possible because these are. The reason I ask is, you know, when you were looking, you know, goes beyond a certain thing. Right. And of course, there it's an acute. Minutes, right. If you do something right. Wrong. Well, the best yeah. example, the best example of that that I can think of is if you're if you're uh, dosing warfarin or phenobarb, right? Uh, you're never going to double the dose. If your INR or or uh, uh, seizure isn't in the right range, you don't double the dose because we know those things are nonlinear. When you're out, when you're at the extremes of your experience, you don't know what that curve's doing out there, and it's just flopping around. So you could you could make a a, a wrong decision if you used a supervised learning model as your test bed, because when it's at the extremes of those, we don't know what it's doing. But if you have a valid mathematical model that says uh, you have 100 receptors. And at this concentration, 25 receptors are filled. The most you can get is 100% filled. And so once you hit 100%, once the model tells you you're at 100%, you can't do anything more. So that's the advantage of what we're doing over um, all these these deep learning methods that people talk about that just take data and dump it in and think it's going to solve whatever the problems. It doesn't because at the extremes, it doesn't have an answer. Um, uh, question is: Highest GFR is normally shown as greater than 60. Are more precise GFRs needed to indicate stages of CKD? No. Um, remember, eGFR is an estimate. It's close. If you say somebody's GFR is 30, tomorrow it could be 25, and the day after that it could be 35 or maybe even 40, depending on uh, what's going on with the patient. So. Uh, it's better to just treat all EGFR categories as uh, about. That's why, I, if you saw my grand rounds when I talked about estimating GFR, that's why I'm not bent out of shape by the estimating GFR programs because they're kind of like, eh, it's about that. It's when they use them and they use a specific GFR cutoff and say 20, 
that you're in one group versus the other, that's wrong. So, uh, uh, no. And the reason that we use precise EGF, uh, GFR measurements in these models is because if, if you have a GFR above 100 mils per minute, what does that mean? That means that 100 milliliters of blood is being filtered at the glomerulus every minute, right? What's the sodium concentration in that? It's 100%. What's the uh, uh, glucose concentration in there? It's at 100%. But when the glucose concentration in urine is zero, mostly. And that's because of the active processes that occur after that. So we know in the model that we have all that. So what we can do is to address that, like we did with the phosphate binders, is we can come in and put variability on those terms after if they become important. But for the state, but, but for the purposes of today's talk in the ESRD, we don't worry about GFR because they have no use. Uh, but you're right. Uh, uh, um, above 60, you know, when I was young and doing studies, my GFR was uh, 140 when I was in my 20s. Uh, when I was, now it's about 70. So I'm getting close to CKD stage three, right? So what is it? Now that we use SGL2, uh -huh. that effective? Well, well, we could. If somebody was on an SGL2 inhibitor, we could we could incorporate that. That's Does a, that change? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Well, thank you, Mike. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank Happy to participate. <laughs>